Welcome to the tutorial on visual recognition for images, video, and 3D at CVPR 2020. Uh, I'm Justin Johnson. I'm an assistant professor at University of Michigan and a visiting scientist at FAIR. And today I'll be telling you about some of our recent work on making 3D predictions with 2D supervision. We all know that computer vision in the last few years has made amazing progress on this task of 2D recognition. And we can now build computer vision systems that input images and make very high quality predictions about those images in the 2D image plane. So here are some qualitative results from my Facebook colleagues on 2D recognition using this task of panoptic feature, uh, uh, panoptic segmentation with panoptic feature pyramid networks. And as you can see, our, our, our computer vision systems are now able to tell a lot about what's going on in these 2D images. But of course, the problem is that the world is not two dimensional and our computer vision systems should be able to understand images, not just in two dimensions, but also in three dimensions. So this is a, a, a research direction that we've been pushing for the last uh, a little more than a year now is extending all of this great work in 2D recognition and trying to push it into the third dimension. So we all are familiar with something like the mask RCNN system which can make very precise localizations of the 2D shapes of objects in images. Well, last year, uh, myself and other colleagues at Facebook published this, this paper on move, where we move from mask RCNN to mesh RCNN, which now takes as input a, a single 2D image and can recognize uh, not just the two-dimensional shapes of objects, but also the three-dimensional shapes of those objects uh, represented by triangle meshes. And we believe that this third spatial dimension of three-dimensional shapes is an important next dimension for computer vision systems uh, to process. So why might we care about 3D perception? Why is this an important problem to solve? Well, I think that making progress in 3D perception will allow us to uh, tackle really exciting and important new application domains in computer vision. One important application domain is autonomous vehicles. Recognizing the two-dimensional shapes of objects is not sufficient for autonomous vehicles. They really need to understand the three-dimensional structure of all of the objects in the world around them in order to properly navigate through this three-dimensional world. Similarly, um, with uh, applications in virtual and augmented reality, we want to build uh, automated systems that allow users to interact with virtual three-dimensional worlds and building computer vision systems that can understand the 3D structure of objects and the world around us could maybe help us both create new content to be played inside these new VR, AR experiences, as well as to maybe help our headsets interact with the outside world in real time. Finally, a third reason why we should care about 3D recognition is that the world itself is fundamentally 3D. And this is a, a facet of the world that should be reflected in the structure of our computer vision models. And we might hope that maybe by properly modeling the 3D structure of the world, we might be able to endow our systems with even better 2D uh, perception problems. So for example, in this uh, basket of puppies, uh, they're all jumbled on top of each other. But if we understood the 3D structure of their bodies, that might help us to recognize them better in 2D as well. Or for this cat, maybe, we, um, maybe this is a very unusual view of a cat that might be difficult to recognize for computer vision systems. But if we were able to understand the 3D structure of the cat's body, that might help us understand and recognize these objects even in unfamiliar viewpoints. So these are, so these are I think, some really compelling arguments for um, important use cases that could be improved by uh, making improvements in the ability of our computer vision systems to understand the 3D shapes of the world around us. But there's a really big important difference between the types of success we've had in 2D vision and the key challenges that we need to make 3D recognition work. And that's this problem of what supervision do we give to our models? We know how to collect 2D supervision for our computer vision systems. Uh, we can go on Mechanical Turk and we can ask human users to annotate 2D information about objects. And this is not cheap, but it is something that we do know how to scale as a community. But now if we wanna train systems that can recognize the 3D shapes of objects, a naive approach would be to try to collect 3D supervision where we might need to supervise our systems not only with uh, two, these, these 2D annotations, but we might also want to supervise them with the, the full 3D shapes of all the objects or their depth or their relative positions in 3D space or the pose of the camera. And all of these sorts of 3D annotations are not as easy to collect uh, by non-expert users on Mechanical Turk. And 
for this reason, it seems sort of difficult to scale 3D recognition in the way that has been successful in 2D, right? How do we, how do we make progress in 2D recognition? We collect large data sets of, of supervised data, and we just don't know how to collect large supervised data sets of 3D shapes of objects. So I think that in order to make progress on 3D recognition, we're going to need to take a different approach. And in particular, um, what I want to try to convince you of is that for 3D recognition to be successful, we need to be able to rely primarily on 2D supervision. Um, and hopefully we should be able to build systems that can make 3D predictions, but are only supervised with 2D supervision. And if we can figure out a way to make that work, then we can hopefully scale our recognition systems and push them into this third spatial dimension. So pushing towards this goal of, of 3D predictions from 2D supervision, um, and today we'll talk about four major topics along this direction. First, we'll review some of our recent progress on supervised 3D shape prediction. Then we'll talk about differentiable rendering and PyTorch 3D as an important tool that allows us to relax these constraints of 3D supervision. And then based on these successes, we'll talk about two applications of learning systems that make some kind of 3D prediction using only 2D supervision, um, that of unsupervised 3D shape prediction and single image view synthesis. So starting off with supervised shape prediction. So last year at ICCB 2019, uh, Georgia and Jatendra and I had this paper called MeshR CNN, which basically extends the instance segmentation task into the third dimension. So at the task level, what MeshR CNN does is it inputs a single RGB image, and then it will output a set of detected objects in that image. And for each of those detected objects, it will emit a bounding box, a category label, um, a 2D instance segmentation mask, and, cr and most crucially, a 3D triangle mesh, giving the full 3D shape of that predicted object. And basically, these, these top three outputs of detecting objects in 2D and then recognizing their bounding box, category label, and instance segmentation, we basically rely on mask RCNN and use, reuse all that same machinery to make these 2D predictions. And the real magic is figuring out the structure of a neural network, which can make this 3D prediction of a 3D triangle mesh giving the objects three-dimensional shape. So that's, that's the novel bit of architecture that we need to talk about here. Um, and I'd like to point out at the outset that this mesh RCNN task is fully supervised. We assume full 3D supervision of ground truth 3D meshes during training. Um, so this is, a, this is a requirement that we'll hope to relax over the course of the talk. And now the, the really interesting part of this mesh RCNN project was figuring out the right architecture, the right way to predict triangle meshes with a neural network. Um, and that's a really important critical component that we need to figure out if we're going to build neural networks that work with 3D mesh data. One basic mechanism that we can use for predicting meshes with neural networks is this idea of iterative mesh refinement, which uh, first, which I, which was popularized by this uh, paper Pixel to Mesh by Wang et al at uh, ECCB 2018. And here the idea is that we will start with some initial uh, category agnostic shape, uh, giving an initial mesh. Um, in this case, they used uh, an initial ellipsoid with a fixed number of vertices, faces, and a fixed mesh topology. And now, at every wrap, then we'll have little neural network modules that somehow uh, input the image and predict a deformation or an offset for each of the vertices in this initial ellipsoid mesh. And then each of these uh, steps of mesh deformation will refine the 3D shape of that ellipsoid and shift the vertices around so that they end up predicting the 3D shape that we want to predict. A big problem here, of course, is that we are constrained in, our, in the topology of the shapes that we can model. Um, and in particular, we can only model shapes whose topology matches that of the initial ellipsoid mesh. So this is a big problem in, in this initial uh, pixel to mesh formulation. The solution that we proposed in mesh RCNN was to use a, a hybrid shape representation. So here in mesh RCNN, we'll start from a, a 2D input image. And then from that 2D input image, we'll do 2D object recognition and recognize all of the objects and their bounding boxes and, and uh, instant segmentation masks. And then um, after making this 2D object recognition, then we'll predict a coarse 3D structure of those objects as a voxelized prediction. And then we'll convert those, uh, those voxelized predictions into some initial coarse mesh and then refine that initial mesh uh, using this idea of mesh refinement from pixel to mesh. And that will allow us to ultimately emit uh, these meshes which match 3D shapes of the objects that we wanted to predict. And now the architecture in mesh RCNN is basically following this exact same pipeline. So it's built on top of mask RCNN. So we use all the same, our, our ideas of a backbone network and an RPN 
um, and then predicting and then using RY align to crop features per region and then do an independent uh, processing of meshes per region. And now within each of those regions, we'll first have a voxel branch that um, predicts a voxelized 3D shape for the object. Then that voxelized predictions will go through an operation called Cubify, which converts the voxel predictions into a coarse, uh, really cubey blocky mesh. And then that cubey blocky mesh will go into this mesh refinement branch at the, at the bottom. This mesh refinement branch consists of multiple, multiple mesh refinement stages. Each mesh refinement stage consists of three fundamental operators. The first is vertex alignment, where we project each of the vertices in the current mesh onto the image plane, and then sample an aligned feature from the image plane corresponding to each vertex's position. Um, and then graph convolution, which, met, which merges information along neighboring vertices in the mesh structure. And then finally, uh, this mesh refinement operation, which predicts offsets for all of the vertices in the mesh uh, to update their position. So then after going through multiple of these mesh refinement stages, MeshRCNN is able to predict a fine 3D shape for each detected object in the scene. And now MeshRCNN is trained with quite a lot of losses, right? So it's, it's built on top of MaskRCNN. So we inherit all of the same training losses as 2D recognition systems. So then there's, our, there's a classification in the region proposal network. There's bounding box regression in the region proposal network. There's bounding box, there's a per region classification and per region bounding box regression, per region instance segmentation in the second stage. Um, as well as a voxel loss to, uh, that is a binary cross entropy on voxel occupancy, and a mesh loss, which measures the, the chamfer distance between the ground truth and the predicted mesh. Um, and then finally, a mesh regularizer, which encourages uh, well structured predictions. And now we compared, uh, at the time, we compared uh, our mesh RCNN model with a bunch of other, uh, with a bunch of other mechanisms, a bunch of prior work on predicting 3D, mesh, uh, 3D shapes from single, uh, from single 2D images. And we, we were able to outperform all of the prior work at that time. But I think where, uh, mesh, where mesh RCNN really shines is by looking at the qualitative results. So here, if we look at the top row, we see some of the images, some input images that can be fed to mesh RCNN. Then in the middle, we see some predictions made by pixel to mesh, um, which is constrained to make predictions which are topologically equivalent to spheres. And we see in this middle row that this model is just not able to capture the holes in the objects, like the hole in the back of the chair or the bottom of the lamp, um, and cannot properly model this like hole in the table either on the right. Whereas our model, by using this hybrid shape model architecture of going through voxels and then refining the meshes, is able to more properly model these uh, very complex topologies of our objects. Um, but where Mesh RCNN really shines is on this, uh, this, this, this uh, PIX3D data set where the task is not, is not working on single isolated objects like in the ShapeNet data set, but really trying to scale to these objects that have, uh, to these images that have many objects. So then this PIX3D data set, we need to um, detect all the objects in the image. So there's a, there's a 2D detection component. And then for each of these detected objects, we need to predict their 3D shape. And we have a new metric called AP mesh, uh, average precision of the mesh, which uh, takes into account both our success at 2D detection as well as our success at pr properly predicting the 3D shapes of these objects. Um, and Mesh RCNN is pretty successful when, you, when we apply it on these real world images from the PIX3D data set. So here's a couple examples of qualitative results on PIX3D. So you can see that Mesh RCNN is able to predict objects with really complex topologies like this, this bookshelf in the upper left. Um, and we also see that Mesh RCNN is able to uh, predict even reasonable completions of the 3D shapes of objects, even for the parts of the objects that are not visible to the camera. So we can see that it, it, it predicts reasonable completions for the backside of the desk and the backside of the chair. Now Mesh RCNN, is, is, since it's really doing object detection plus 3D mesh prediction, we're able to predict many meshes per scene. We're also able to do amodal, amodal completion, which is kind of interesting. So if you look at the predicted mesh for the couch, um, it actually predicts the part of the a mesh for the part of the couch, even where it was occluded by the dog. And what's another interesting thing to recognize in mesh RCNN predictions is that oftentimes failures in 2D recognition also propagate to failures in 3D shape prediction. So if we look at this bookcase example, we can see that in the left, the predicted mass for the book for the bookcase misses some parts of the bookcase, and those same portions of the bookcase are also missed in the predicted. Uh, 3D mesh for the bookcase. So this suggests that maybe improvements in 2D recognition could also lead to improvements in 3D shape prediction. 
Okay, so this gives us a, a quick summary or a quick recap of where we are on supervised shape prediction as of ICCB last year. Next, clearly, we need to introduce some new tools to move beyond this, uh, this regime of supervised 3D shape prediction. So in particular, the, the big problem with mesh RCNN is that it needs to be trained with 3D supervision. So kind of at a high level, the way that mesh RCNN works is that um, we take this input image, we run the input image through our model, our model makes some kind of 3D prediction about the 3D structure of the objects. Um, then we compare our predicted 3D predictions with some ground truth 3D shapes of all those objects, compare those two with some loss function, and then backpropagate our errors back into the model. Now, as we saw with Mesh RCNN, this, this sort of paradigm is able to work pretty well and enables us to train deep learning systems that make fairly high quality mesh predictions. The problem is that this 3D supervision is super expensive to obtain. So we'd really like to find a way to train these models without requiring 3D supervision. And here, a potential solution is this idea of rendering and comparing or an analysis by synthesis. The way that this might work is that we could take our input image run it through our model to get some kind of predicted 3D shape. And then rather than applying a loss in 3D, instead we could render that 3D shape back to a 2D image and then have a loss function that compares this rendered 3D shape with some ground truth 2D uh, annotations and then have a loss function that operates in 2D rather than 3D. And now if, we're able to, if we were able to set up a system with this kind of, in this kind of way, then we could potentially backpropagate all the way through and be able to learn to make 3D predictions, even using only 2D supervision or 2D losses. But now a big technical problem here is that to make this possible, we need to be able to compute derivatives through this rendering process. So for that, we need to introduce this notion of differentiable rendering. So differentiable rendering is, is, is basically a differentiable version of a renderer. So what a renderer does is it inputs properties of a, of a scene, like uh, 3D shapes and their textures and the camera coordinates and maybe the lights and maybe other sorts of properties of the 3D scene, and then goes into some kind of rendering engine that will again then combine all of that 3D structure and boil it down to a, a, a two-dimensional RGB image. And now this RGB image might go on into some other part of the system and be used downstream and plugged into 2D loss functions or something else. And then for this to be, what does this mean for this rendering engine to be differentiable? It means that later on, that it means that this, this whole, we wanna treat this whole rendering engine, this whole rendering process as a layer in kind of a deep learning system. So that means that after we take our RGB image and pass it along to some other part of the system, then later we'll receive some gradient, DLDI, giving the, the, the gradient of some loss L with respect to the rendered image I. And then we'd like to be able to propagate these gradients backward into the 3D scene properties and propagate backward through this rendering engine and then compute the gradient of the loss with respect to the, to the mesh, gradient of the loss with respect to the camera parameters, the, with respect to the texture, and with respect to all the other scene properties. And if we had a rendering engine that could fulfill, that could be back propagated through in this way, then we could embed rendering as a, as, a, as a fundamental layer or fundamental operation as part of our deep learning systems. And it, this turns out that this idea of differentiable rendering is actually possible. So, but to understand why, we need to take a step back and recall a little bit how rendering works at all. A graphics 101 reintroduction to rendering is that rendering is this process of taking these, this 3D scene geometry and projecting it onto the 2D image plane to generate a, a 2D image. So rendering generally consists of two high level steps. The first is rasterization, where we've got these set of primitives in 3D space, often triangles, and we, want to, and we first project those primitives onto the image plane in order to determine which primitives are visible at every pixel in the image. And then the second step after rasterization is shading. So this is actually computing the final output color of each pixel in our, raster, in our image plane. And this is generally done after this rasterization step that, that first determines which primitives are going to be visible from each pixel. And um, now this, this, this shading step in traditional graphics is actually fairly differentiable because the way that shading usually works is we usually have some kind of properties on the vertices of our triangles, like colors or depth information or normal vectors or textures or whatever. And then we will interpolate those properties over the interior of the triangle. And this interpolation step is actually differentiable. Uh, assuming we know which primitives are going to be covered by which pixels, and we know the position of those pixels within the primitive, then this sh these, these shading steps are, are sort of naturally differentiable and e pretty easy to work with. 
On the other hand, this, this rasterization step in, in sort of traditional graphics is not differentiable. And it's not differentiable for two reasons, really due to boundary, uh, to, to boundary effects around the triangles and also due to occlusion effects. So to understand this, we can try to zoom in on this, this just one pixel of this rasterizer to understand these, these problems with non-differentiability. So now imagine what would happen if we were, so now if we're zooming in on this green pixel on the left, and we imagine what would happen if the X coordinate of this blue triangle were to continually, uh, to continually move. Well, um, right now, the, with, the current the, with the current position of that blue triangle, it's, uh, it's visible in that green pixel. But if that triangle were to move to the left, then eventually it would no longer be visible from that pixel. And the color of the pixel would all of a sudden change from blue to orange um, as that triangle moved to the left. And that, that step change in the color of the pixel means that fundamentally the color of that pixel is non-differentiable with respect to the X coordinate of the blue face. And that gives rise to this step function in this pixel color graph. We get a similar non-differentiability as we imagine moving the Z positions of these two faces. So for the green pixel currently, the, because the blue triangle is in front of the orange triangle, that pixel in green is colored blue because the, the blue triangle is in front. But if we imagine sort of continuously changing the Z coordinates of those two triangles, then that pixel would be blue, 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 blue. And then the instant that the orange triangle moved in front of the blue triangle, then the pixel color would change all of a sudden to orange. And this again gives us a sort of non-differentiable step function in the pixel color as a function of the Z positions of these faces. So this, this is a, this is a non-differentiability non in the Z position due to uh, occlusion effects. And now these are two way, these are two reasons why traditional rendering is non-differentiable due to boundary and non and uh, an occlusion non-differentiabilities. Now there was a really nice paper from uh, ICCV 2019 last year that called a uh, soft rasterizer that proposed a really nice way to fix these two non-differentiabilities in traditional rasterization. So the tricks are so they basically use two fundamental tricks. One is that we'll make all of the triangles semi-transparent and we'll in, have that transparency increase as we move away from the center of the triangle towards its boundary. And then second, rather than having each pixel um, be, color, be covered only by one triangle, instead we'll compute the color of each pixel by blending the influence of many triangles that it covers in, in, uh, in, in, in the Z direction. And once we make these two adjustments to traditional rasterization, then it fixes these two non-differentiabilities in the rasterization process. So this means that now the, the color of that highlighted green pixel will smoothly change from orange to blue as we move either the, the X coordinate of the blue face or as we move the Z coordinate of the two, uh, of the two faces. So this sort of fixes the non-differentiability problem and allows us to build a differentiable rendering engine. So uh, we were really, I was really excited by this paper last year at ICCB 2019, which I should point out is, is not my own work. It's, it's not work from FAIR. Um, but we were really excited by this idea um, but wanted to try to scale it up and make it more industrial strength to be used in a wider variety of applications. So for this reason, we built our own differentiable renderer as one of the fundamental components in PyTorch 3D. So PyTorch 3D is an open source library maintained by myself and others at Facebook, uh, at, by, the, by the vision team at Facebook AI Research that is meant to accelerate and make it really easy to use all these important primitives for 3D deep learning of which differential rendering is one really important component of 3D vision, in my opinion. So then uh, our, our, the render in PyTorch 3D is really fundamentally a similar design as the soft rasterizer. Um, it uses the same ideas to cover, uh, to, to account for non-differentiability in the traditional rendering pipeline. But in PyTorch 3D, we make four major changes that give big gains in both efficiency and modularity of our renderer. So the first change has to do with efficiency. So in soft rasterizer, they have each pixel be a function of all, all faces along the Z axis that hit that pixel. Um, even if there's like a thousand faces that intersect that pixel along the Z axis, soft rasterizer, soft rasterizer will compute the pixel color as a function of all of them. Um, we make an approximation for efficiency. Instead of computing the pixel color as a function of all the faces along that ray, instead we consider only the k nearest faces to the pixel in the z direction. And this simple change gives us a huge win in efficiency. The second change is a kind of technical detail around how we implement rasterization. 
So in soft rasterizer, they have this brute force loop that checks for every pixel, for every face. Does the face hit the pixel? If so, do some cal calculation. In PyTorch 3D's renderer, we use a two-step course define approach, where we first break up the image plane into a set of tiles, and then first do computation at the tile level before dropping down to do computation at the pixel level. And this allows us to save a lot of computation. The third big improvement we make over the soft rasterizer uh, pipeline is in modularity. So in particular, um, we move all of the shading logic into PyTorch. So in soft rasterizer, this entire graphics pipeline of rasterization and shading is implemented as one giant monolithic CUDA kernel. And this makes it really difficult to mod to experiment and to tweak and to play around with our renderer. So in comparison, um, in PyTorch 3D, we implement the rasterization step in CUDA, and all of the all of the logic of shading is implemented in PyTorch and relies not on hand computed derivatives that it's written in CUDA, but instead you can work on using traditional PyTorch operators and use uh, automatic differentiation to compute derivatives. And this makes it really easy to extend the PyTorch 3D render renderer and plug in sort of new shaders, new lighting modes, new texturing modes, and it makes it really easy to extend and, and sort of customize the rendering pipeline. Uh, as a simple example, we can easily write a custom shader in PyTorch 3D that does differentiable silhouette rendering with just two lines of PyTorch using kind of a sigmoid and some, some, uh, some cumulative, some cumulative uh, products. But, it'll, but this shows you that we can just use traditional PyTorch operators to really flexibly extend the render and make it really easy to, uh, to incorporate uh, new ideas in differentiable rendering. So then the, the, the fourth kind of technical change we make over soft rasterizer is support for heterogeneous batches of data. So what do I mean by heterogeneous batches? These are batches of triangle meshes where each element in the batch might have different numbers of vertices and different numbers of faces. The heterogeneous batching can arise in many circumstances when working with 3D data. So this is something that the PyTorch 3D renderer can handle natively. So these four changes give us a pretty big improvement in uh, efficiency compared to soft rasterization. So for example, here are some results at uh, textured mesh rendering where the x-axis increases the size of the meshes that we render and the y-axis shows the, the time it takes to do a forward and backward pass through the renderer. And as you can see, soft rasterizer uh, has a pretty steep slope. As, as we go to meshes with like 40,000 faces per mesh, then soft rasters might, might take more than a second for the forward and backward pass. So in contrast, PyTorch 3D is much more scalable due to all of these uh, improvements that we talked about on the previous slide. So in particular, for this setting of rendering uh, textured mesh rendering at 256 by 256, 256 images with a batch of eight heterogeneous meshes, uh, we can get improvements of more than 5x compared to soft rasterizer. One thing I should point out, though, is that we do end up using a lot more GPU memory than soft rasterizer due to the particular way our modular implementation is put together. So this gives us this new fundamental tool of differentiable rendering uh, for PyTorch 3D. And we can, now we can see how we can use differentiable rendering for a new task of unsupervised shape prediction. So here, this is kind of tackling a similar problem that we did in MeshRCNN. We would like to build a model that inputs the image, um, kind of runs through some kind of image encoder and some 3D shape network, and then eventually predicts some 3D shape for the object in the image. But crucially, now we want to supervise this model using only 2D supervision, and we never want to have access to the ground truth 3D shapes of objects, even at training time. So what we do is we take this predicted 3D shape, we uh, render it using our differentiable silhouette renderer to predict the, the silhouette of that object in the original viewpoint. And we compare the predicted silhouette of our predicted 3D shape with the, true, with the true ground truth silhouette of that object in the camera view system. And then by comparing those two in 2D, we get a 2D loss that we can backpropagate through the differentiable renderer and use to train this uh, 3D shape network. But now the problem is that 3D shapes are ambiguous from a single view. So to get around this problem, we actually supervise not from a single uh, viewpoint during training, but also from a second viewpoint during training. So after, after we make our 3D shape prediction from the input image, we'll rotate that predicted shape by a known rotation and translation, um, and then render it from this second viewpoint. And we assume that we also have a, a ground truth silhouette of the object from a secondary viewpoint that we can compare our predicted shape now from two viewpoints with the ground truth silhouette of that shape from two viewpoints. 
So then the supervision of this model is that it receives during training is the input image, two ground truth segmentation silhouettes, and the rotation, the known rotation translation of the second viewpoint relative to the first viewpoint. And with only this sort of 2D supervision, we are able to train these networks that do 3D shape prediction. Now we also need to talk a little bit about the, the architecture that we use for these shape prediction networks. We compare with one architecture which had been used by a lot of prior work in this uh, unsupervised 3D shape prediction literature. So here we use this, uh, this so-called sphere FC architecture. So here this inputs the image, we take the image and then run it through a ResNet 50 encoder and then have a couple of fully connected layers that will predict vertex offsets from some template sphere mesh. Then these offsets are added to the template sphere mesh and this gives us the predicted shape. Um, and this architecture has been used in a lot of prior work on 3D shape prediction. But there's kind of a problem with this architecture. The, the fully connected layers don't really properly respect the structure of the 3D shape. And I think that makes this architecture somewhat hard to train. So we also propose a new architecture for unsupervised 3D shape prediction that is kind of more inspired by mesh RCNN. So we still run the image through this ResNet 50 encoder, but then we use these ideas of vertex alignment, graph convolution, um, to predict these, these vertex offsets from our template shape. Um, and now by using vertex, this vertex align operator, as well as graph convolution, it allows the architecture of our model to be better adapted to the 3D structure of the object that it's predicting. So here, um, we do, we, in, in our experiments, we do some initial experiments on ShapeNet, where our goals are twofold. First, we, we train the system both with the, the PyTorch 3D differential renderer, as well as the, the prior SoftRAS differential renderer. And we also compare this Sphere GCN model with this Sphere FC model. First, we see that uh, Sphere GCN outperforms Sphere FC by a pretty wide margin. Um, and second, we see that PyTorch 3D ends up giving better results than soft rasterizer by a little bit. Um, and this, this means that even though we, had, we made these sort of approximations in our renderer compared to soft RAS, um, for efficiency purposes, those approximations do not affect any task performance on downstream tasks. And in fact, might even improve performance in some cases. But now what's also interesting about the PyTorch 3D render, because our render is more efficient, it allows us to scale to larger images and also to larger meshes. So if we just kind of naively run the exact same model, but now use a higher image resolution for computing these renderings, then it improves the performance of both the Sphere FC model and the Sphere GCN model. So this required no modeling changes at all. It just required bumping up the resolution, which we, which we were able to do um, because of the efficiency of PyTorch 3D. And then we can also improve the performance by just increasing the size of our predicted meshes as well. So um, because of the efficiency of PyTorch 3D, we're able to scale these models to predict even larger meshes with even more vertices and more faces. Um, and just by simply scaling both the image size and the size of the predicted meshes, we're able to improve the predictions of our models. Um, then we can look at some qualitative results. So here on the left, the leftmost column shows the input image. Um, the next two columns show predictions from this Sphere FC model. And the next two columns show predictions from this Sphere GCN model. Um, and the first thing to note is that like these predictions look pretty good qualitatively. Like this is pretty, pretty amazing that we're able to give, make predictions of this quality using no 3D supervision whatsoever. The second thing to point out is that this Sphere GCN model is much better able to capture the fine details of these, of, of these objects. So if we look at the chairs in the second row, we see that the Sphere FC is unable to capture the bottom part that's connecting the front and the back chair legs, whereas Sphere GCN is better able to capture this really fine detail in the chair. Or in the bottom row, we see that Sphere FC is unable to capture the, the, this interior space in the middle of the table whereas Sphere GCN is able to somehow deform the initial sphere to prop better model this, this complex structure of the shape. And now when we move to this HD Sphere GCN model that uses uh, the exact same model just with a larger sphere mesh, we see it does an even better job of capturing the fine details in the meshes. So in particular, once we move to this high resolution Sphere GCN model, it is now also able to capture this, uh, this tiny hole in the interior of the back of the chair in the top row. And again, these, are, these predictions use no 3D supervision whatsoever. We're able to train this model that makes 3D predictions using only 2D supervision. These previous results were um, trained using silhouette rendering. We can also train models that predict textured meshes. And then uh, rather than comparing silhouettes, instead we compare uh, rendered RGB images with different sorts of shading models. And we can see that again, not only can we learn to predict 3D shapes with only 2D supervision, 
we can pr even predict textured colored 3D shapes using only, again, 2D supervision. So, so far we've talked about meshes. Um, we can also apply the exact same model to make point cloud predictions. So rather than, rather than uh, predicting a mesh by deforming some initial sphere, instead we start with some set of initial points in a point cloud and deform the positions of all the points in the cloud and then render the points using a differentiable point cloud renderer. And again, use a similar sort of pipeline to predict textured through RGB point clouds using again, only two dimensional two view supervision. Um, so I thought this was this is pretty exciting that we're able to make these fairly high quality predictions of 3D shapes and even textured 3D shapes with both meshes and point clouds by using this um, by using our high performance renderer from PyTorch 3D. So this gives us this this shows now how we can use this this tool of differentiable rendering to do this new task of unsupervised 3D shape prediction. Um, but th but these uh, these these unsupervised 3D shape, 3D shape prediction results that we saw we're basically on single isolated objects for this kind of synthetic shape net data set. And now for our final task, um, I wanna talk about this, this paper we have at this CVPR, which applies similar sorts of ideas, but pushes them to very realistic, complex real world scenes with many objects and a lot more complexity. So here, the, here this, this paper is called SinSyn and, and View Synthesis from a Single Image that was led by Olivia Wiles during an internship at FAIR last summer. Um, as well as with uh, Georgia and Rick from, from Facebook as well. So here the task that we tackle in this, in this paper is a single image view synthesis. So what we'd like to do is take an input RGB 2D image and then imagine what that scene would look like if we were to make some 3D movement in the scene. So given this, this uh, 2D scene, what would happen if I, what would it look like if I st took a step forward and then sort of turned to the left a little bit? And this is a challenging problem for a couple of reasons. Um, one is that we need to understand, we need to properly understand the depths of all different objects in the scene in order to model how they transform under view transforms. So for example, these bushes are closer to the camera, so they compared to these trees in the background. So the bushes should move less compared to the trees when we, may, when we, when we move in the image plane. We also need to deal with uh, occlusions and in painting missing regions. So in, as we, in this example, as we move to the left a little bit, then some additional portion of this building became visible. Um, and in order to do a view synthesis, we need to be able to predict plausible completions of objects as they become visible due to disocclusion. So now the goals for this project are, are one, like I said, we wanna push this towards really complex, realistic scenes and with a lot of interesting stuff going on. Second, we wanna train with no 3D supervision whatsoever. We only wanna train this on pairs of images and just a whiff of 3D supervision only in the sense of relative camera pose between those two images. And third, we'd like at test time it to rely on only a single image and be able to generate novel views from a single image uh, at test time. And fourth, we want to train this thing end to end using a deep neural network. So our approach is this idea of a latent point cloud of features. So um, the way our architecture works during training is that we start from some input image here on the left we run this input image through a feature network, which will predict a feature vector for every pixel in the input image. Then we'll set those aside and also run our input image through a depth prediction network, which is going to predict a depth for each pixel in the input image. And now we've got a, now we've got a, a feature vector for every pixel in the image, we've got a depth for every pixel in the image, and we can project those feature vectors out into space to create a point cloud of feature vectors um, for that, where each, each uh, pixel in the image is now represented by a feature vector in this uh, 3D point cloud. And now what we can do is we can use the, the, the known translation and rotation to, 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 and to combine with a differentiable point cloud renderer um, to, um, to project these feature vec this point cloud of feature vectors onto a second view in a differentiable way. And once we, get, once we project these feature vectors onto the second view, this now gives us a tensor uh, back to a two-dimensional tensor of feature vectors that gives us the projection of those feature vectors from the second view. And now these projected feature vectors can be run through some, some generator network, which is again a CNN, that gives us our final output predict predicted image. And now this predicted image is then passed to both a discriminator, which tries to tell whether or not it's real or fake, as well as compared with a ground truth target image using both an L2 and a perceptual loss. And now what's really critical about this architecture is that during training, it doesn't receive any 3D supervision whatsoever. 
The only supervision that this model gets during training is the input image here on the left in green, the target output image here on the right in blue, and the known camera pose between those two images uh, shown in purple. And using only this sort of 2D supervision, we're able to train these models that perform really good uh, 3D aware single image view synthesis. And now we test this model on two types of data sets. One are these data sets of room scale 3D scans, um, Matterport 3D and Replica. And the other is this data set called Real Estate 10K, which consists of um, walk like real world videos of people holding a camera and walking around in houses and apartments um, where they've reconstructed the camera pose using structure from motion. So then in Real Estate 10K, you've got these real world videos with uh, known camera poses between adjacent frames in the video. Now we do some ablations on Matterport 3D and, and compare with some prior work and we show, and uh, you can read the paper for more details, but our, our, uh, all of these model components that we have are pretty, pretty, pretty important for our overall performance. What's more interesting here is to look at the qualitative results. So here's an example of an input image on the left. Um, and now here is the ground truth from, real estate, uh, from this Real Estate 10K data set of a person like walking through this scene um, in, in 3D. And now here is our prediction where we predict these, where we predict a video or of motion through the scene by generating novel views at every at, at every frame of the video, and we can see that our model that our model is able to learn some pretty non-trivial processing for doing this view synthesis task. So um, if you look at the if you kind of look at the left, it's able to do plausible completion of this banister um, as additional portions of the wall become visible on the left then the model in paints or invents pixels on the left that sort of complete that banister. Um, we also see that the motion of the, the couch and the background behind uh, in, in the background are all kind of moving in a plausible, in a, in, a, in a way that makes sense according to the 3D structure of the scene. We can also apply our model to work in other circumstances, like as we kind of walk through this doorway, we compare the ground truth video with our model and we can see that it's again able to properly model the 3D structure of the scene when generating novel views along this trajectory. Um, and our model works not only indoor, it can also work even in outdoor scenes, like this complicated situation of a person walking down a path in a forest. And our model is able to generate plausible uh, view synthesis results even in these fairly complicated scenes. Um, another way we can introspect this model is by looking at the predicted 3D point clouds because right, there's basically two important steps in this model. One is predicting the 3D point cloud, and then the second is sort of predicting the input, the, the final image using this decoder network. And by looking, by just visualizing the point cloud directly, we can get a sense for how much of this in-painting is due to properly predicting the 3D structure versus sort of in-painting and texture synthesis with the, with the decoder network. Um, and now some really other important, some really other cool experiments we can do with this model are zero shot generalization from one data set to another. So we can take our model and train it on the Matterport 3D data set. And then at test time, we can run it in a zero shot way on the replica data set. And we can get pretty good view synthesis results even in this zero shot generalization transfer setting. We can also do zero shot generalization to new to higher image resolutions. So we usually train our model at uh, an image resolution of 256 by 256, but we, after training at this lower resolution, we can just, just, the model is fully convolutional, so we can just apply the trained model at a larger resolution at test time, and it still gives very plausible results, um, even at this zero shot generalization to higher image resolution. So that's our, that's our final task for today. So here in this talk, we've kind of talked about our overall progress towards making 3D predictions from only 2D supervision. So first we saw this task of 3D shape, of supervised 3D shape prediction, and we saw how um, in mesh RCNN, we had this nice architecture with graph convolution and whatnot that lets us predict 3D meshes from 2D images when we have supervision. Then we talked about differential rendering and PyTorch 3D as an important set of tools that we can use to, to break away from this constraint of 3D supervision. And then finally, we saw these two example ta examples of tasks, unsupervised shape prediction and single image view synthesis that were able to make really interesting and complex 3D predictions uh, even though they were only supervised with 2D supervision um, through this use of differential rendering. And now moving forward, I'm really excited to continue pushing differential rendering um, and other related techniques as ways to continue to push the state of the art in recognizing 3D structure from 2D images using only 2D supervision. 
So thanks for paying attention and um, happy to take any questions at the, at the, quest, at the Q and A session later on.